Want to know more about the Fox Alien 40 Watt Laser? Then keep watching. Welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel, love laser or CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Fox Alien 40 Watt Diode Laser. We're going to understand how they've achieved this 10 Watt output of this laser. We're going to take a look at how they've overcome some of the other models of machines that can't run these higher watt lasers. We're going to see how you install it and then do some tests at the end. But let's start by diving in and seeing what you actually get in the kit itself. So the box it comes in is fairly small. If we open it up, we are presented with the instruction manual. Next, we have a couple of cables. There are two cables in this packet, if I just pull them out. We have a long one and a short one, depending on the laser that you are connecting to and how much movement you need to have in the head of the laser itself. We have a glasses case. Obviously, there should be some glasses inside here. We nice pair of orange colored to protect from the wavelength of the laser and a uh, lens cleaner as well. We then have the laser module itself, obviously well packaged if we take it out. There we are. So this is obviously the Fox Alien 40 watt laser. I'll just show it around all sides. And then we've got the control board and the laser itself. So I've put that to one side. We have the depth stop. This is to help focus the laser. So you've got a consistent focal point. We have a couple of screws to presumably help mount it. And last but not least in this box, the laser shield itself to sit on the front of the laser. Obviously, this will just sit over the laser there and just give you some protection from when you're working with the laser. Also included in the delivery is a pair adapter kit, and I'll cover that in the next segment. Now we're taking a closer look at the laser and also how to fit it to your machine. So let's talk about the specifications of the laser itself, and we'll start by looking at what's listed on the front. Wavelength is 445, that means you're getting a blue laser beam coming out of this laser. The reason that's important is we also know the colours that we need in terms of protection then for our eyes and the laser shield and goggles. So you're talking reds and oranges. Greens will also protect as well, but usually orange is the most common colour. Now the next is the focal distance, 30 millimetres. That means from the base of the unit down to your material, you need to leave a gap of 30 millimetres. This is a fixed focus lens, which means that gap always remains consistent. There is no adjustment in the lens to counteract that. Now the power, which is the next line, is probably the most important. And this slightly frustrates me with the market. They always list the input power. So on this unit, it is a 40 watt input power. On this particular setup, the output power, which is the most important figure, is around 10 watts. So it's about a quarter of the input. Now that doesn't sound very efficient, but when you compare the Fox Alien to one of its equivalents on the market, something like the Atom Stack, to the Atom Stack to achieve the same 10 watt output needs 50 watt input. So actually the Fox Alien is quite efficient in comparison to, to some of its competitors. Now, if you'd have gone back a couple of years, people would say there is no way you can have a diode laser outputting at 10 watts. I don't know if that is technically true, but I can explain how they are achieving it with these lasers. So let's bring in some special effects. We'll do another Spielberg setup. I'll just position that in front of the camera and put the laser next to it. So to achieve the 10 watt output, what they are essentially doing is using two separate diodes running at about five watt output. So you'll have one at the top of the unit coming down vertically, and then you have one at the side of the unit coming in, and they both pass through kind of like a prism, prism mirror setup which sends the beam down towards the bottom. It then passes through the focal lens at the bottom, obviously giving you that um, 30 millimeter distance that we spoke about before it hits the material. So essentially to achieve that 10 watt output, you actually have two five watt diode lasers here combining into one laser. In terms of the size of the laser, if I move this out the way, and we'll just bring it in its baby brother, the Fox Alien 20 watt laser. And if I put them side by side, we can see the differences. So this is the um, 20 watt, 5 watt output, and this is the 40 watt, 10 watt output. So basically 
double the power. Now in order to accommodate that extra diode laser in the setup, we can see there is a size difference, about 18 millimeters overall. This is about 110 millimeters and this is about 128 millimeters. As we can see, we have got a slightly longer barrel for where the lens sits in as well. The other thing to note about this is these are 40 millimeters wide. The reason that's important is if you're looking to fit this on something like a 3018, the holder will not take these. You will need an upgraded holder to take this. The 3018s usually take a, I think it's a 32 or 33 millimeter. So yeah, just remember that these won't typically fit on something like a 3018. The build of the two lasers are very similar as well. We've pretty much got the same fan set up and control board going on top with the same um, components being used. So we know it's already tried and tested and therefore we're going to get good results and i think the longevity of the laser is estimated something like 10,000 hours so you know we should be good for quite a long time um, similar setup again with the cooling of the laser with the heat sink on the body just to enable the laser to run efficiently as possible if you use air assist and you have an air assist nozzle, the good thing about this is both of these are the same diameter. It's around 18 millimeters, just shy, give or take a tenth of a millimeter. So if you already have an air assist nozzle, whether there's a 3D printed one or maybe a brass one from somebody like Laser Wizard, then they will simply fit over the same as they used to on both of the nozzles. Fitting the laser shield is extremely simple. There are two holes at the top of the laser shield. These relate to the two holes on either side of the laser. You slide the shield over, make sure that the two holes align, and then grab one of the black bolts provided with the circular heads, slide those through and make sure they align, and then just starting to tighten it up. Obviously, don't make sure you cross the thread. They are fine threads, so do be delicate. Now, for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to use the laser shield, but if you do use it, what I would recommend is always wear goggles or something else as well, just as extra protection, because some of the stray light can come underneath this shield. So yeah, it's all for your protection, and just make sure you do the most you can. The two most common ways to mount a laser is either using a fixing plate like this with the small screws provided. So you'd simply just place those through if I can do it. And then obviously fasten that to the back and then attach that back to your machine. The alternative method, usually if you're mounting this onto like a CNC machine, is to place this into the carriage holder for the spindle. So we'll move over and I'll show you how to do that now. So I'm quickly going to show the installation on the Fox Alien Vasto, but when I do the testing shortly, I'm going to do that over on the 4040XE purely because it's in the enclosure. So take the spindle out, obviously make sure all the power is disconnected and disconnect the cables from the spindle. You only need to loosen the bolts on one side of the carriage and this will remain that the um, holder stays in place. So slacken those off and obviously take the spindle out with care not to knock or damage anything. Now at this point, you'll want to drop the laser straight in. Your holder will need to have these little ridges in the corner in order to accommodate the laser. One other thing that I should point out is if you are using the laser shield, when installing them into a holder like this, the laser shield will need to go on after the laser has been installed. So we'll drop this in. Now typically I pretty much slide it all the way down. And then we'll just go around, pinch the two bolts up on the side until it starts to clamp the laser itself. Then as I say, at this point you can install the laser shield underneath and it just fits up inside the two gaps either side of the laser and you still have the bit of movement within it. Once it's held in place, we can then connect the cable. This has quite a big work area, so we'll use the longer cable for this. Both ends of the cable have exactly the same connector. So just plug one in, paying attention that the two little arrows go into the slots on the side of the connector. You push that in and you will just about fairly click into place. And then we'll take the other end of the connector and connect it to the back of the control unit. So before we move on and connect this to the back of the controller, let's talk about power consumption. Now I've already mentioned we're running two diodes in this. So essentially you're running two lasers at the same time. And the reason that's important is it's trying to draw twice as much power as something like the 20 watt laser if you want to run this at 100%. Now there are only two machines in the Fox Alien range that are capable of doing that, which is the Riser and the Riser Mega. The Vasto, the 4040, they, won't, they will only run this at about 70-80% power. In fact, a lot of machines can't output enough power to get this going at 100%. So how do we get around that? 
Well, I always mention about how great Fox Alien customer service is. So in, to ensure you can run these lasers at 100% power, they also provide you with a power adapter kit. What this essentially is, is a, um, a black unit, a bit like the type of thing you would have powering your laptop. And it allows your controller to still control the laser itself, but it will draw the power from this power pack separately. So it's not pulling the power from the control box itself. And it just guarantees that you can get this up to 100% power, no matter what machine you're using. The setup is really simple as well. If you need to use this, you just connect the power pack to the open end connector there. You've got an open JST connector there, which you connect the laser existing laser cable to. That goes in, click it in place. And then this is the cable that now goes into the back of the laser instead of that one. Obviously you've got to plug that in to draw the power, but it just guarantees that you can run this at 100% no matter what setup or laser that you're using. So we simply then take that connection setup and plug it in to the back of the laser. Again, make sure the orientation is correct and you'll just fairly click into place. Now, depending on what type of setup you have, also remember if you have a switch between a laser and a spindle, switch that over to laser to ensure everything runs correct. So I just want to show you the laser beam as well. Obviously, this is out of focus because of how far away it is. But what we can see is the shape is actually quite square. That is a good thing. It means more of the laser energy is being focused into a center point, And therefore, cutting is going to be better and more consistent. On some lasers, this comes out more rectangular, which is bad. The reason for this is it, it's spreading the laser power over a wider area. And it means that as you're cutting in different directions, you will get inconsistencies in the cut. So for example, if you have a different laser that has a rectangular um, shaped laser, you may notice that when it's traveling in one direction, it cuts fine, and as it changes direction, it cuts differently. The advantage of having a square laser beam like this is it should cut much more consistently whenever we're using it. So let's move on and start to do some testing with this laser. Now, obviously this is a newer, more powerful diode laser, but we've already done a whole range of tests and experiments with other lasers that we've reviewed in the past. Obviously, if you want to see them, check out the laser playlist in the corner. So to save stretching the video out any further than it needs to be, we're just going to focus on some tests that we would expect this higher quality laser to do, such as some deeper cutting tests. So let's dive in, have a bit of fun with the laser and see what the outcomes are. So the first test is is quite simple it's a speed cutting test we've got some three mil base wood on the bed and we're going to cut out a series of hexagons all these will be cut at 100 percent power we're going to start off at 300 millimeters per minute and go up by 50 millimeters per minute for every cut so let's see how we get on and how fast we can cut through with this laser So what we can see is that it cut clean all the way up to 550 millimeters per minute and it didn't quite cut through on the 600. Ignore this one for some reason I had this set to multiple passes so it's essentially void. As I say it didn't cut through at 600 millimeters but if I flip this over what we can see is it nearly went all the way through so actually it wasn't that far off and maybe a speed somewhere in between say um, 600, uh, 575 for example, probably would have cut that through. We can also see that there's very little overburn on the backs of these cuts as well, which is pretty nice. It's exactly what we want from cutting thin material. So we've got a piece of 12 mil point on there. We're gonna try and do this in eight cuts at 250 millimeters per minute at 100% power. And let's see if we can penetrate all the way through this. So we cut this out really clean. It probably did one or two too many passes because the bit had already fallen out before we got to the end. But it's nice to see that it can cut through this thickness of material. And let's try another test. So after doing the test with the circle, we went ahead and cut out this Fox Alien from the same 12 millimeter material. Now we did this in eight passes. You can start to see on some of the tighter edges where it's doing the, the slower traverses that we've got a bit of overburn going on. At the end of the day, it is eight passes, so that is probably expected, and a light sand would take that out. In terms of the actual cutting, well, it did cut pretty well. The one thing you have to take into account with material like this is the different sap content and the different um, density between the grain as it starts to cut. Now, on some letters, it did struggle. If I just pick the L up here, 
but you can start to see these little points almost like triangles at the bottom of the letter this is where it didn't quite cut through now as it does each pass once it starts to struggle this will naturally get worse so that's why they are like points like the tip of the pen as it gets deeper it will get wider as a triangle but it still came out okay as I say, at the end of the day, you probably shouldn't be using a diode laser to cut 12mm thick wood, but it just proves we can do it if we want to. So I couldn't cut all the way through the wood, and I think one of the reasons for this is the air assist not being powerful enough. It is fine when doing shallower cuts, but when trying to do deeper cuts like this through 18mm material, it really do, does need that higher pressure to get into the cut. So what I decided to do was actually cut the wood open and see just how deep it did get. Now we are talking about probably a good 15, 16 millimeters into this wood. In fact, on the side of there, that probably comes down to about 17 millimeters. So it was getting close, but didn't go all the way. And as I say, perhaps with a higher powered air assist, we could have cut through this material. But again, you also have to factor in with um, natural wood like this, the sap content and the density of the grains as well. Every time I test a new laser, I like to try a new technique. And what we have here is just a piece of aluminium, but with nail polish painted on a purple nail polish. Now the hope is to try and engrave some of that color into the metal. It may work, it may not, but let's see how we get on. We're gonna run this at 100% power at 1500 millimeters per minute. So this is the aluminium piece after it has been lasered. Now, as much as I love the look of this and the rough edges and the finishing on the paint, I think it gives it a really cool vibe. I suspect what will happen is once I start to clean this up, the all of it will actually come off the aluminium. So let me try and clean it up with something that will take the paint off and see if it's left any markings in the aluminium. So I've now cleaned this up and what we can see is the silver is really coming through in between the logo. I don't think this has engraved the aluminium how I would have liked it to, so that's kind of a fail, but I do love how crisp and clean the cut in this paint has come out. And the paint is actually really durable. I was using some wipes that are that are meant to fetch off um, you know, excess paint and that type of thing, and it hasn't touched it at all, which is actually really great and shows how durable this is. And as I say, with the effect of this kind of paint spatter around the edge, I actually really like the effect of it. So I may do more tests like this in the future, just to see what can be done. Recently, I needed to engrave some clear acrylic. Now, a diode laser will not engrave clear products unless you apply something to the surface of it. So I experimented with something called Brasso, a liquid metal polish. You apply it on liquid and it dries to a solid state fairly quickly. Then what you can do is laser the surface of that, which will allow it to engrave into the acrylic, and then simply wipe it off at the end. And the products come out really clean. You get a nice engraving in the acrylic, and what you can do is apply a little bit of light, and you get great products like this that can easily be sold as night lights. I really do love how cool those little lights are and they're so easy to make as well. We're talking about a bit of acrylic and a low voltage light that you can pick up from Amazon or like dollar stores, those type of things. You can even get um, USB powered ones to make your life easier. I will try and put some links in the description area below for little components that you can use to make these. But we've done some testing with the laser. We've seen roughly how deep it can cut. And as I said earlier on, I think we can get it to go through that 18 mil material if I increase the pressure on the air assist a bit. So I'm gonna to continue to experiment with that. And that is the goal to make it cut through that 18 millimeter point. Now, obviously going back a year or two ago, people would said you would never get a tight 10 watt diode laser working on a machine. So it's great to see how technology is moving on. And I'm looking forward to seeing how Fox Island continue to progress with this. But for now, it's great having such a high powered laser on our desktop CNC machines. If you are considering buying one, please do check out the affiliate links in the description area below. They do not cost you any extra. I may just get a tiny bit back in commission to help keep the channel going. Now, if you have any questions, chat with me down below as well. I'll do my best to answer them or some experiments that anybody wants me to run with this laser. We'll have a bit of a play and a bit of fun with it. Thank you all for watching. Final thanks always goes to my patrons. I'll see you all on the next episode.